Tundra presents. The Mayor Helps, with the Mayor of Victoria, British Columbia, Bolisa Helps. Have your say. Send your questions and comments to themayorhelps.com. They could be included and, in next uh, week's Victoria show. Businesses to know that we're working. And now, here's your host from beautiful Victoria, British Columbia, Dave Hatt. Welcome to The Mayor Helps. My name is Dave Hatt, and I'm here with the Mayor of Victoria, BC, Lisa Helps. Good morning, Mayor. How are you today? Good morning, Dave. I'm very well. And I just wanted to know, have you heard any updates in terms of what the goal is with COVID? Because in certain parts of, of Canada, um, the graph is trending upwards. People are getting infected. The word on the, that I'm hearing or that I'm reading is that they still want to make sure that the healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed, that nurses aren't overwhelmed. I just wanted to know if you had any inside information in terms of what the target is now, or if it's in fact the same, just keeping where we're at right now until such time as more medication becomes available in whatever format that, that takes. Yeah, I don't have any. I don't have any inside scoop, um, but I think it is good to raise those words once again, flatten the curve, um, because I think people are tired. I think people are tired of wearing masks. I think people are tired of hand sanitizing everywhere. I think people are tired of staying with their same six. I think I think people are tired of of not having what has been for you know our whole lives normal. And I think that's the reason we're starting to see the numbers go up. I mean, here on Vancouver Island, we're just doing incredibly well. And I, I you know, I don't know if it's because we're hyper conscious of of following those rules, but we've we've had so few cases. I mean, on Vancouver Island, our our curve is still quite flat. You know, it, not not many new cases. But I, I think um, the, the goal is exactly as you say, the goal is to make sure that, you know, we remember back to those early days of, of March and April when we were, you know, banging our pots every night at seven, thanking the people on the front lines, whether they're grocery store workers or, or nurses. Uh, and, and those people are still uh, working hard. They're still putting themselves at risk just by going to, to work and doing their jobs. And so I think as much as possible, the goal is to really, um, keep those measures in place, you know, do the, do the distancing, wear the masks um, for all the reasons that you stated. So we don't, we don't tax the people who've been working so hard already for, for months now. The tough question becomes to what end? We have a fairly flat uh, curve in, what, in Victoria on Vancouver Island. Uh, certainly I know parts of, you know, BC is doing quite well in relative relatively speaking to other parts of the world, but the economy is still very slow. I guess at what point do we kick up the, the dial and, and open up the economy a little bit more? Is, do you have any indication of that and, and who's going to make that call? Well, I think the provincial health officer will make that call. I mean, she's been the one making the calls all the way along. And it's true, the economy is very, very slow right now, um, you know, in, in Victoria and across the country. Uh, I was uh, talking with the mayor of Halifax the other day, and they're in the same situation that we are with a lot of provincial office workers not coming back to work uh, yet. Um, because, you know, I guess provincial offices need safety plans and need to be outfit. I mean, it's thousands of people and we're, we're really starting to see the impact of that. Um, there's, there's very little lunch crowd uh, in the downtown, very few people going for that after work beer. Right now, at least we've got a little bit of openness. At least restaurants can, can be open having people sitting down, you know, thinking again back to earlier in the spring. Um, restaurants were closed. They could only do takeout. Hair salons were closed. Like, we don't want to go back to that. And so that's really the balance, I guess. Yeah, it, it's uh, when you're on this side of the aisle, when you own a business and to see it and to say, okay, well, you know, and, and how much I'm a big believer in science and I do listen to Dr. Bonnie Henry and I do believe what she says. The thing that I'm, I'm starting to be concerned about and increasingly so when I speak to, to different small business owners all over North America is the impact on them uh, in terms of their mental health. If they can't- Absolutely if they can't open their business, have sunk their life savings into it. They have a plan, had a plan. It was working. It's now all gone. People are resilient. We, we are seeing, you know, that, that phrase is, is coming up. Um, but 
it's it's tough to be resilient sometimes when when you when your uh, business is barely scraping by. Well, yeah, I mean, it's tough to be resilient when you have no customers. I mean, the, the, the very definition of business resilience is that you've got, you know, some form of money coming in to cover the money going out and a little bit to take home at the end of the day. That's why people get into business. They get into business to serve their customers, to create livelihoods, to create jobs. And, and right now, that is, that's, that's, not, that's not the status quo. The status quo is you know, stay apart, stay at home, don't come to work if you're sick, don't come to work if your kid's sick, don't come to work if your kid's friend is, you know, so it's really, and and all that don't come to work, I mean, it's good public health advice for sure, but it's it's very challenging for you and others who are who are running these small businesses whose customers are, you know, not behaving as, as business as usual. And, you know, I think the thing that must be really stressful, it certainly is for me as mayor in a different way, is we don't know when the end is. We don't know what the new normal looks like or when it's going to come. And so we're in this strange holding pattern. And, you know, for small businesses, many of you are just trying to hold on. And I, I wanted to snap my fingers and get all the provincial workers back to work. That would help you, right? They'd put their suits on and, and go into the office. It would certainly help all the, the restaurants and shops downtown. Um, you know, hopefully after the provincial election, we'll see some of that return to work. I know the province wants to bring workers back. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's a challenge. It is. I'm afraid it's an unknown and, it's, and it is an ongoing conversation. Thank you for this. And uh, let's chat on the other side. Okay. See you there. And now Mayor Lisa Help sits down with this week's special guest. In this segment, we've got the pleasure of speaking with Eva Jackson and she is the Canadian managing director of ICLE and I'll, uh, say that out for you. It's the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. Welcome, Eva. How are you doing today? Thanks, Dave, and thanks, Mayor Helps, for having me. The International Council for, for Local Environmental Initiatives. I was reading on the website that you're focused uh, quite a bit on, or the, the whole organization was built around the UN um, advancing global goals. So maybe you could explain a little bit about what it is you're doing, because it seems like you've got your hands wrapped around quite a ball here where you're dealing with the sustainability in terms of communities. I really like and connect with the idea that we, we help each other across communities as opposed to waiting for a top down solution. So maybe you could just explain about a little bit about your organization. Sure. So we use the phrase local action moves the world um, as our sort of raison d'etre. The idea, as you just said, that, you know, the, the accumulation of all local action is as powerful or more powerful than action by one national government or by a subnational government. So you're right. We um, we are actually just celebrating our 30th birthday uh, this in September. So we're kind of wrapping up our 30th uh, birthday celebrations, and we were started because uh, in 1990, Agenda 21, this idea of uh, kind of Co cooperative governance and collaborative governance was being brought up at the UN and uh, it was kind of brought to the attention by uh, mayors back then that you know we have a role to play in this as well as local government leaders we're more closely tied to people than you are as national governments um, and we want in and we want to be valued and considered as important in this space and so we were formed uh, in September 1990 at a meeting of 200 local governments in conjunction with a larger UN event in New York. And since then, um, our work has evolved out of traditionally environment work uh, to broader sustainability. And that was really because we realized that, you know, if people don't have safe communities, if people don't have a quality of life, um, they really they can't focus on the environment and you can't take the environment out of quality of life and safety and community building. And so uh, in 2002, <laughs> we rebranded as ICLE Local Governments for Sustainability to try and kind of show that it's more than just environment, that it's all intrinsically linked together. We've been doing this podcast for we've got about 16 or 17 episodes. So somewhere three to four months we've been doing it. And I got to be honest, I, I come at this from a small business uh, perspective, always felt connected to my community. I, I own a non-toxic dry cleaner. I literally clean my neighbor's dirty drawers. 
what I do. So I'm really connected to my, my neighbors. Uh, but it's, we've seen this and heard this time and time again with the mayor is that, that we're better off connecting and it. And it seems we're more fully, we're able to live a more full life when we are connected internally within our own communities and also looking to other uh, local municipalities and communities and cities to see what they're doing as, in terms of best practices. And I'm, I'm seeing this thread that's, that's pulling through. And one of the things that I did want to ask you about is it, it appears as though ICLEI has gone and sought counsel from Indigenous communities in terms of their opinions and viewpoints on sustainability. So perhaps you could touch on that as well, because I do find it interesting. It's the, the people that were the, the real stewards of the planet uh, before industrialization came along, going back and asking them, saying, hey, you know, what do you think? Is that where you're at and is that what's happening? That's what we're trying to do more and more. And by no means... Uh, have we always done that? I think we're, we've learned that there is a massive and incredible opportunity with uh, Indigenous groups and elders to learn from that um, and to ask more questions than to give answers. And I think previously engagement with First Nations and other Indigenous groups was pretty top down or pretty check boxy and not really, we didn't seize that opportunity well enough. And particularly when we're talking about climate change and trying to understand what, beyond what the science says happened in the past in terms of weather events, what did that actually mean? Like, can we color in that picture as opposed to just give the outline through data? And I think that's what we're learning that equal to the data is this a traditional knowledge of what was and how things have changed from an experiential perspective and not just from a perspective of science. And so we're trying to do that and by no means are we experts, but we're trying to have, uh, maybe I'm in, still in school mode, but our listening ears on as opposed to our talking ears, our talking mouths, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right, it is interesting and timely because in terms of timing, last night was the first presidential debate of 2020. And, and you know, regardless of the political si side of the aisle you, you sit on, it was, it was a train wreck. Um, there wasn't a lot said, and there was a lot of accusations and, and misinformation thrown around. When you see things like the state of California that's on fire constantly at this point, um, what are the things that you're hearing, say, from the Indigenous community, or are there any solutions that they're coming forward that are saying, look, this is something that we, we know how to deal with? Or, or is it, again, like you touched on, a science-based approach we're going to have to deal with? I think, there, I think we have to divide that into deal with and break that down. I mean, we have to deal with fires as they happen as emergencies that we have to deal with in the moment. But then in that time between, the next deal with is how do we prevent more of them from happening, um, right? So that's in terms of, you know, fortifying our structures and things like that, making sure we're not building in the wrong places, making sure we're building in the right way. Um, but then the softer side, which is, in my perspective, equally as important to that hardening of infrastructure, which is, and I think this is what we can really learn from Indigenous groups, is building that connective tissue, those communities that can help each other and that will prepare us for more of those incidences, while at the same time trying to reduce the things that are causing that in the long term, you know, from transitioning to a low carbon economy, moving to renewable energy, all those things. I mean, that's the long game. Um, I think there's things we could be doing in that immediate deal with that prepare us. And from my perspective, COVID is doing a really good job of showing us the importance of that social infrastructure and not just pipes, wires, buildings, roads. Well, and what you're talking about, Eva, and what you know, what you and I have been talking about for a few years now through the Resilient Forum. What do we call it? The Local Cities Forum. Local Cities Forum, right? It's like everything pre-COVID has escaped my brain. But is is this notion of building resilience in communities, and and that's uh, that has to go hand in hand with, as you said, the, the hard infrastructure. And so, one of the things I just if if either of you haven't read it, I strongly recommend. Eva, you've probably read it. It's a book called Resilience: um, How Things Bounce Back. 
And it's, uh, it's really, really, I just finished it. It took me a month and a half to read, which is just such a sad commentary on my life right now but, <laughs> and how busy I am trying to manage a global pandemic. Yeah. And an economic crisis. But nonetheless, the, the book really lays out examples from around the world about what resilience is, how we build resilience, and, and the simple definition of, of resilience that they give. And I'm, I'm not going to quote it exactly because I don't remember it, but something like, you know, the ability to remain in a, in a certain state without tipping into, you know, disaster, whether it's a community or a person or a family. And, and I think one of the things that COVID has revealed is is some pockets of resilience, but then also places where resilience uh, is really, really needing to be built. So can you talk a little bit about that? Like how has COVID changed how you think about resilience, how you think about that, that connective tissue that needs to be built? And you know, are, I know it's, it's, we're still in it, but are there any lessons learned or things you've seen that you think would be useful for us to know? Um, yeah, I mean, it has, a thousand percent solidified my perspective that it is that social infrastructure that helps um, you helps one kind of avoid that tipping point and I see it just in my own everyday life and how my little pocket of this behemoth city of Toronto has become more resilient in the midst of a crisis right from sharing libraries and you know we have this uh, running joke on my street called you know the r street general store which is the who the heck has poppy seeds nobody wants to go out and find poppy seeds and somebody randomly has poppy seeds and it's those little tiny things that actually build resilience and are not money dependent right it's about having a having social capital not financial capital sure somebody had to lay out for those poppy seeds but <laughs> Presumably that's go that goes back and forth and that's the stuff that I think we need to invest in where it doesn't kind of pop up organically because it won't everywhere. Um, but I think there's investments we could be making into that. And my fear is that we invest in the things that have financial value and return on investment immediately and we don't invest in those other things. And I think, you know, in terms of the what we're in the middle of it, but what can we do. Um, I think a lot of the investments we've made into making local businesses thrive now are an example of that, you know, the other thing we talk about, Lisa, multi-solving, right? Well, so that's what I wrote at the, at the end of the book. I wrote, like, they're, they're wrapping it all up. And I just wrote, I was totally thinking, I wrote, resilience is multi-solving. Yeah, ex it exactly is. And the best example I can give is restaurants have been suffering hugely, all, all service industry, but restaurants come into my mind. So what they've done here is they fast-tracked kind of the policy and the bylaws to extend patio season, extend, extend patios into curb lanes, um, on roads, et cetera, here in Toronto, uh, certainly along my stretch here of the Danforth. And what that's done is obviously businesses can thrive a little longer into the fall season. Their patios have expanded. So there's an economic kind of resilience aspect here. But the social capital of that is immense like what we craved for six months was human contact yes with the people we know and love but also just with the people that are around us and by extending that patio you know you're helping the restaurateur but you're building the social fabric in a community where people want to be you know we've clearly showed we're we're kind of sick of being just inside our houses and so these neighborhoods that have that social infrastructure um, I think can really thrive. And so my, my hope would be that we can fast track those things more and keep them more to see all the benefit, all the kind of boxes they check and not just, okay, we improved economic development for these businesses. It's a good thing to hear that the Danforth, I lived on the Danforth for several years, actually, you know, Pape and Danforth and Donland with my wife and uh, you know fabulous neighborhood and it's good to hear you speak specifically of it because it is you know a predominantly Greek um, community with tons of restaurants and tons of vibrant nightlife and I'm glad to hear that that it's um, they're doing what the mayor and council here has done which is extending the patios because I know the mayor and council have done a, a really remarkable job here and fast tracking those items uh, the next step I think in terms of getting businesses back on which is something I'm, I'm touching on with a separate podcast 
is um, the live music industry and the entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, at my, when I was in Toronto, I worked in the film industry. The you know, nightclub shut down, like the Dakota Tavern, I'm, I'm told is in Toronto is a month away from closing because of the impact of the insurance company not re renewing their insurance policy. So those, these multiple layers of you know, financial, financial and social impact through COVID, it's, um, you know, it's, good, it's something we, we all need to work on collectively. So is, what, what are you seeing in terms of best practices beyond the restaurants? Are there, are there things with uh, perhaps with the homeless in Toronto that, uh, that are working or, or in other cities that are working? Yeah, I think homelessness has been, you know, a massive concern um, in light of COVID. And I think uh, there's been a significant effort to enable community, uh, community service providers and social service providers to do, to do more. Um, so obviously that's with direct funding to those groups uh, to help people more. Uh, I think, you know, expediting, uh, hotels as a good example right using city staff who were kind of taken off other projects to get hotel rooms uh for homeless people to not have to be in crowded shelters which are already um you know bursting at the seams but you know back in march and april when it was still quite cold here uh we're really it was impossible to do any sort of social distancing or any of those covid measures i think that's one um, I think another real effort that has been pushed here, and I'm sure it's the same in Victoria, is um, alternative transportation, right? People are not going to go back to mass transit in the same way um, that they did in the past. So making, you know, making sidewalks bigger, um, putting in even temporary bike lanes to get people not in personal vehicles is another good example of what can be fast-tracked and expedited by a local government um, to serve a broader purpose. The, the bike lanes here have, have, uh, have certainly been developed and, and I, I think that people are using more self-propelled uh, modes of transportation. I'm sure Mayor Helps can speak a little bit to that. How, what are the results here that, that you know statistically in terms of people since COVID or if you do know, I don't mean to put you on the spot, about have people increased their, their bike use? That is a very interesting question. We do have uh, bike counters in all of our lanes. I don't have the data, but um, it, I'll, I'll get it because it's a really interesting question. I mean, I think in March and April, we saw no one going anywhere, so it was quite slow. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, we can get that data. That, that's a great question. But certainly we've done the same thing here, expanded sidewalks, yeah. particularly in village centers. And I think, you know, there was a day that our pro provincial health officer, uh, Bonnie Henry, told everyone to walk, bike, and run to work. And we were like, yes. You know, yeah. the bike lanes here have not been without controversy, but, you know, but again, that's that, that's that infrastructure that, that, it, you know, that's an example of hard infrastructure, but that has those social, those health yeah. and well-being benefits. You know, if you can take your kid out and go for a safe ride through a city in the middle of a pandemic, not worrying about getting hit by a car, stopping, you know, by the waterfront or whatever, it's like, that's, that's the, that's kind of the infrastructure that's necessary for resilience that comes in handy when we happen to have a pandemic. Well, and that's, I mean, that's key. So Dave, you wouldn't even recognize the Danforth. You can bike from the furthest East End to High Park in a protected bike lane right now. And without COVID, that would not have happened. Um, so for example, you know, our little neighborhood has started walking school buses and biking school buses to avoid, you know, parents all driving and convening on even a regular school bus. So I think it's things like that where you can take a piece of hard infrastructure and then leverage that to become more. You know, I'm seeing four, five, six, seven year old children biking on the Danforth. Like this is bananas to me, had you said that to me a year ago or even six months ago, right? You would have never thought to do that. There was no lane, there was not even a sharrow on there. Um, and Toronto's not the only one. Like it comes to my mind because normally I'd be, have, have gone to a few cities between now and last March. Um, so. I'm just, I guess I'm thinking of home more, but as you know, Mayor Helps, you said, all cities are trying to find the, the entry points they have to kind of address the pandemic and to build that community connection, I think, that they're seeing is what people want. That's the reason people live in urban centers, 
right? Otherwise, we would all be living in rural and remote areas. I think we, we live in centers because, you know, employment is there, but also because we crave that connection. Living on the Danforth uh, certainly brought it to, to life. And, and I think that, you know, the downtown Victoria, obviously, it's a, a much smaller city. It's, it's working hard to, to be more vibrant and, and you know, it, it's, it's such a moving target right now. So maybe one of the last things I'd like to ask you, what are things we can do to help out, to help connect ourselves with our community, to help be better, better municipal uh, and local citizens? Um, I think, you know, if we say community is like your neighborhood, the two kilometers in and around you, it's just connect with people and you'd be surprised what can come out of it. Um, you know, start a WhatsApp group on your street and you'll be surprised at the amount of walking groups, exercise groups, reading circles that come out of it. I know, you know, we're kind of going back into or out of social bubbles, but if we think about the long term, eventually this too shall pass and those connections will stay. Um, and I think the other thing is not to be scared to connect with people who aren't like you, but to embrace what can come out of that. I think quite often in our neighborhoods, we connect to, you know, in my case, some of the other parents, but don't be afraid to push the boundaries of that and, you know, have, have connections with people who may share different interests with you, who may look different to you, who may do different things than you and see what comes out of that. I think those are low cost, really easy things to do. Um, and technology enables that right now. Uh, but hopefully the, the three-dimensional aspect of that will come back sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have anything more to add, uh, Mayor Helps? Well, no, just thanks for joining us. And hopefully, uh, as you said, this too shall pass. And I think there's a lot of work we need to do as, as local governments across the country, um, you know, having, continuing to have the conversations we've been having for the past few years about what is it that, what's our role in enabling more of that citizen-led and resident-led um, and small business-led resilience building. So I'll look forward to that soon, hopefully. Thank you very much, Eva Jackson. I appreciate you coming on board and, and we'll, we'll stay in touch. Yeah, thank you very much. Stay well. Okay, bye. If you enjoyed the show, please like, share, and subscribe. And visit themayorhelps.com to submit your questions to the show.